Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us and spending part of your evening learning about Canberra and how it can help your patients in your own practice. We're really excited tonight to spend some time talking about implementation and the progression of the Curie-Free system. Before we get started, just a few housekeeping items. Um, you are all muted, so we can't hear any comments or questions verbally. Please make sure to type questions into the questions box at the right-hand side of your screen. At the end of the presentation, we'll have about 15 minutes to answer questions. We do our best to get through as many as possible. Any questions that we don't have time for will be addressed by email. And we also offer one-on-one -on -one webinars for practices interested in learning more. And lastly, you should have received an email with a webinar handout to help you define your Canberra protocol. If you don't have the handout, you can find it online by going to carryfree.com. On the dentist side of the website, go to Learn, Webinars, and click on Webinar Schedule. From there, you can download a copy of the handout. And with that, I would like to go ahead and introduce Dr. Kim Cooch, CEO and founder of Oral Biotech in the Carry Free System. Dr. Cooch has been successfully practicing dentistry for 30 years, still practicing three days a week here in Albany, Oregon. He has a huge vision for curing dental caries, motivating him to start this company. And it continues to motivate him in the research he's leading to improve caries diagnosis and treatment. He has a lot of passion for what he does, and it's always great to hear him speak. And we also have Dr. Yolanda Mangrim with us as well. Uh, Dr. Kuch, I'll let you take it away and introduce her as well. All right. Hey, well, thank you, Janelle, and uh, thank you, everybody, for being with us tonight. Um, I'm pretty excited uh, and a little bit nervous. I've got uh, a, a whole new format for this program. Uh, we've got a great guest with us uh, that I will introduce here in a little bit. But just wanted to share with you my goal here is uh, I've been working on this program since literally since July, and I was reviewing a paper that had been written on how to implement Canberra, and then I was reviewing the reviewers' comments who had uh, who had evaluated this paper, and it was all about Canberra, but it wasn't about how to do a step-by-step -step implementation of it, and and so I kind of for the first time I realized you know what what I've been teaching personally is really all of the science behind Canberra and the kind of things that you would need to know or, or appreciate or here's the things that have validated why we would do it a certain way, uh, but really hadn't got down into the trenches. Uh, you know, while I've been doing this for 12 years of my own practice, it just makes sense uh, to me that, you know, gee, this is easy, but looking at it from the outside, I, I really got a couple of fresh perspectives. and so. I really started working on this program and when I read that paper in July and I thought, you know, their comment was, gee, it's a great article on Canberra, but I still don't know how to implement it. And I thought, you know what, we really need to go back. Uh, this, is a, this is a challenge for people. And so I sat down and identified over the last uh, several months 20 different decisions that you need to make uh, where there are alternatives or options in how you go about this in your own practice. And I'm not going to be one to tell you exactly how to do it, but what I want to do is present, here's, what's, here's what you need, here's what's required, and here are the options you have at each step while you're making that decision, and then let's talk about each of those, and then pick one. Uh, and I, I really don't care you know, which options you pick. Um, I really just want you to know that these are the kind of decisions, if you're going to be successful at implementing this in your practice, this is what you need to know, and, and these are the decisions that you need to make. Um, so with that in mind, I, you know, we put together this program, and, uh, and so you know, we're going we're gonna to go through this tonight. Tonight is kind of the appetizer. Uh, as we put this together, I really want to start talking about um, your why and, and why you are doing this or why you're you know, anticipating implementing this in your practice, you know, what your real motivation is, and, and getting some clarity on that. Um, and then we'll get through the risk assessment form tonight. I want to show you options, and I want to discuss those forms individually. Um, so we're only going to get to one, um, I guess, option where you're going to need to pick one tonight. The next um, uh, webinar that we do, part two, is going to have about 10 questions that you'll need to make decisions on. And in the, the last, the third part of the series, we'll have 10 as well. So now I really want to get into philosophy and, and really get to the, to the ground level and, and start there. Of course, uh, Janelle gave me a, a wonderful and warm introduction, and you all know kind of my personal history and, 
you may or may not know that I'm also a banjo player. But tonight I want to start with why. And I've, I've been mentioning this book here for two years in my, in my programs and my webinars. I think that it's really important that, you know, every day when we get up, you know, to have the joy of life, the joy of what we do and how we help people and the difference we make in their lives, to be really clear about why we do that. Simon Sinek wrote this awesome book. If you haven't read it, it's one of the better business books that I've read. Um, and I'd encourage you to read it. He also did a TED Talk. You can find that on YouTube. Uh, and I'd encourage you to watch the TED Talk as well. His point being that people don't buy what you do. They buy why you do it. Our patients don't come to you because you're a dentist or because you have this or because you have that in your practice. They come to you because you've developed a relationship with them and they, um, they respect you and, and they buy into why you're there. They know that you're passionate about what you do or that you, you made it clear to them that you really care about them. And, you know, when they come to you, they come to you for those reasons. It, it, it's not, you know, I, it's interesting. You'll see the, uh, the survey that says, well, the number one reason uh, people leave dental practices is because of insufficient parking. You know, really, I don't think so. You know, so it's like they don't come to you because you're convenient. Maybe, you know, maybe they are, there are a segment of the population that are going to come to you because you have convenient hours or you're located in the mall or whatever. But the majority of my patients and your patients come in every day because of who you are and why you do what you do. Um, you know, so why am I here and why am I doing this? I think for me, it, I'm really clear about this. You know, we have a, an epidemic of decay. It's global. It's the number one disease in every country. It's number one in every age bracket in every country. And the United States in particular is getting worse. And, you know, we've been spreading this message for a number of years, and finally even the pediatric dentists are, are I'm starting to hear this. I'm starting to read it in the newspaper. You know, the, the decay rate in our zero to five-year-old children in the United States is going up, and it's going up at alarming rates. And, you know, so what you and I were trained to do as dentists isn't working anymore. And what I was trained to do, uh, you know, the drill and fill model of, of dentistry um, and the use of some fluoride and tell patients that they need to brush and floss, it, it, you know, that worked for a while. And literally we have a generation of, um, in our society, my children's generation, that are by and large decay-free. And I think so that was the window of time when fluoride worked really well. It was really effective. You know, like any other antimicrobial or antibiotic agent, they have a window of, of maximum effectiveness. And I think that generation benefited from that. I think the next generation, we've got a whole different uh, disease, and then we need to approach it differently. So, you know, what we're doing isn't working anymore. We're not going to drill and fill our way out of this issue. Uh, this isn't going to be solved with some new bonding agent or some new better filling material. What we really need to get to is we need to get back to figuring out why these patients have the disease and see if we can solve that. And I think that our, you know, our patients are looking to us and the, and the society is looking to us as the profession to solve this problem. So this epidemic is not okay with me and that's why I'm here. I want to do something about this. You know, so, you know, we talk about what's causing this pandemic, and I like to kind of simplify things. We're going to get into some real specifics on risk assessment forms tonight, but I don't want that to be too complicated for people because if you can do basic pattern recognition, I see the same patterns over and over and over again with this disease, and if you can, make, if you can just learn to recognize some of the major patterns, it makes the whole process a lot easier for you and your team, and it, and it may take a little while to develop a sense for that. But essentially, you know, when I was in school, you know, it was a, this was a disease of mutant streptococci and lactobacillus. At this point in time, we know this disease is much more complex than that. You know, we still have the bacterial biofilm issue here. Typically, the patterns that I see on patients are they either have too much bacteria, too much bacterial load in their mouth, or they've got their too much or too prolonged periods of, of low pH, so those bacteria are behaving badly. They're, they're producing acid and behaving in an acid uric fashion. Um, if we look at diet, certainly we know that diet is a huge issue, and typically patients are either eating too much sugar, hidden sugar, or they're uh, eating too frequently, and that, that becomes an issue when we look at the Stefan curve. Saliva is a real challenge for us today. Saliva is the protective mechanism for your teeth. That's how nature, you know, designed the system, and, you know, without sufficient saliva, this thing gets out of, out of whack in a hurry, and so certainly um, medications, you know, prescription drugs, you know, hyposalivation, that's the number one side effect of prescription drugs. We'll talk about that in a minute. 
and then genetics. This is really something that this field has been developing a lot in the last three years, and there have been 11 studies uh, that have identified different associations of genes um, with, uh, that would in increase your risk for dental caries. And so I think while that's not something we can measure just yet, it's something we all need to be aware of. And, you know, it could be that, you know, genetically you just got, you know, bad genes. You know, we're dealing with that as well. But at the end of the day, this always comes back to our old friend Kaiser Sose. This is a disease of pH. Uh, so if you can start to just think about that pattern recognition when you look at patients and ask yourself, do I think this is a bacteria problem? Do I think it's a diet problem? Or, you know, does the patient have saliva? I mean, these are things that you can assess very quickly, diagnose them at hello, if you were, and then kind of use the form and that whole process then to, to I guess, support what your, um, your thought process or diagnosis is. When we look at the bacteria, there are now over 50 bacteria that have been identified in our scientific literature as potential carriagens. Uh, the most recent was added uh, earlier this year by Diana Wolf and her group from Germany, uh, propionic bacteria acidophations. Um, in this study, uh, it turned out it was the only bacteria that was strongly correlated um, or predictive uh, for high caries risk in this population of individuals. Um, diet, you know, diet's a problem in America. Um, <laughs> it's why Americans look the way they, that we do. Um, Americans eat. 22.7 teaspoons of sugar per day, I've, and I've just been reading a number of studies uh, looking at behavior. Of course, you know I'm, I'm uh, wellness coaching is the topic that I've been studying here for the last two to three years, and looking at how addictive sugar is. I think you guys just saw on the news this, this last week, uh, Oreo cookies in the study in, I think it was in Connecticut, um, Oreo cookies turned out to be as addictive or more addictive than cocaine uh, in the study they did with rats. And, and that may be maybe a kind of a stretch on their conclusion, but I think it points out the fact that um, our dietary habits around sugar are, that's a serious issue for us to have to deal with. It's not something easy for patients to change. And, and Americans, we're addicted to sugar. High fructose corn syrup, for a long time I thought perhaps that was part of the issue that we've got going on uh, in the U.S., but the real, the real issue with high fructose corn syrup is more related to hypertension, obesity, and fatty liver disease. Um, high fructose corn syrup is not metabolized in the mouth. It doesn't get metabolized until it's actually in the liver. So that's not really contributing to the prolonged periods of low pH, and there have been studies that support that. But at the same point in time, Americans were number one worldwide. We eat 51 pounds per year per person. Uh, number two is Mexico, and they only eat 32 pounds of high fructose corn syrup per year. So diet certainly is an issue for a lot of patients. Typically, we're seeing that in, in the form of beverages like, let's say, Mountain Dew. Um, saliva, this came out from the Mayo Clinic in June this year earlier. Over 70% of Americans take 70% of Americans across the age brackets take one or more will take one prescription medication per day. So like 70% of us are taking one prescription medication per day. More than half of us take two or more. So you start compounding that hyposalivation. Half of your pa patients, I would tell you, statistically coming into your practice have a hyposalivation problem if they're taking two or more medications. The odds are likely that that's a problem out of the gate. 20% take five or more, and now we're talking about our senior patients who I know you see that come in with an entire page or a sheet list of, list of the medications that they're taking. There were four billion prescriptions written in the United States last year for $320 billion worth of drugs. So that's a major issue that, I, I, that all of us are dealing with. But saliva, you know, here's our support protective mechanism for the teeth, and, you know, there's some medications that are damaging that as well. So then we get into genetics, and there have been a number of studies. This one, um, Schaefer and Feingold, this was a great uh, study. They looked at, did a genome-wide association study. They looked at uh, 975 adults from age 18 to 75. They looked at 518,000 gene sites. Like we have the computer power to be able to do that these days. And they found uh, 10 major associations uh, between genes and decay rate. They actually even identified that there are geographic appearances for this disease uh, within the mouth, geographically within the mouth. Uh, so that, you know, the Lysel 2 gene, for example, uh, that's a bacteriolytic enzyme that's found in the saliva. Patients that have a mutation or a deficiency of, of Lysel 2 uh, end up with decay only on their mandibular incisors. 
And you know, that's a really unusual situation to see. That's where most of the saliva is. Those are the last men standing typically from this disease. So to see only decay in that part of the mouth is, is unusual. And you know, if you see that, you can probably think you're dealing with something genetic. You know, so this patient came to me, and some of you may have seen this photograph. This patient came to me a number of years ago. Her dentist, uh, I think we can all uh, agree on the fact that this patient is extreme risk for dental caries. Her patient had placed six uh, porcelain fused and metal crowns on her, you know, maxillary anterior teeth a year before. Now, you know, that's, you know, when we start to talk about the why, and I get into this conversation with Yolanda tonight, you know, the, the question here is why. You know, this is how we were taught to, taught to treat this disease. We were taught to treat it with a drill and, and restorative materials. You know, the, the what was going on here, you know, you know, they've got all these cavities. You know, the dentist had that part right, but the problem is it wasn't a what issue. You know, they had the how part. Well, this is how we were trained. You, you, you restore it with crowns or fillings or whatever. But that's not really the problem here. The real problem here for this patient is why. And so the whole basis of risk assessment in Canberra is to get to the answer of why for each patient, because then you can personalize their, their therapy and the medicine for them. You know, the, the, question, the real question here is, why does this patient's mouth look like this? Because if I can't figure out why they have this disease, I don't have a prayer. Those crowns are not going to hold up. That's not going to last. Um, I, you know, I don't know if anybody of you have seen anything like that. So one of the questions that I have, tonight for you, I think one of the most important decisions that you have to make is why are you implementing Canberra? You know, what is the benefit of doing this going to be for you and your patients? So as you're contemplating that, I want to introduce you to uh, Dr. Yolanda Mangrum. Uh, Yolanda and I met earlier. She was at a, a program at the CDA earlier this year. Um, and then she, was, she and I were both at a dental meeting just in septem September, I think. Feel honest yes. together. Maybe it was obvious. Yeah, sure. um, and and we started uh, this conversation on why would you do Canberra? And, and Yolanda, you've been doing this your practice for a long time, and you brought I thought a really fresh perspective uh, to this. And you and I had a, a conversation a couple of weeks ago that I wish that we had recorded because I, I really want to hear. I think you have some just brilliant ideas about uh, what the benefits of doing this are for for practices. So. Uh, Fire away. I think one of the things, okay. Yolanda, that, that you brought up to me uh, when we started that conversation was, well, why aren't people already doing this? This seems so obvious to you and I. It's like, so why isn't everybody doing this? And I think the question you asked me, is it too complicated? Do people understand it? Uh, is it because they don't know how? And I think that that's really the basis for that. That's really why I put this program together. Let's get down to the nuts and bolts and, and kind of figure this out. Absolutely, and I think one of the bigger uh, questions of why is um, is that we as pre um, dentists and is that we feel like doctors should know all the answers and have all the answers, and and really um, this day and age we are moving more into a partnership with our our patients, and that's actually a much healthier place for us to be because. I think too often we try to own that being our crown, that being our um, our um, dentistry that we did, we've done, and we want to we want to make sure that it's going to work and last, and and we want that ownership. Um, we want them to ha you know we want to know that that was taken care of, but too often they leave from our office, and we don't. We don't. We're not there with them. We're not taking. We're not brushing their teeth. We're not helping them control what they're putting in and how they're bathing. Um, what's going over that? So I, I brought up the word ownership um, and really getting the patients to be uh, uh, an owner of that, and um, because they want to know why. And if you start with why before you start this procedure, then they're working with you in partnership. And if that fails at that point, you have some legs to stand on. You know, Yolanda, this is such a, a, an important point. I mean, the patients want to put the monkey on our back, right? That's, right. That's why I, I threw this picture in there. This ha happens to me like every week. The patient wants to say, well, I wasn't having any trouble with this tooth doctor until you worked on it. Well, okay, let's think about this. You had a huge cavity in there. Uh, maybe you weren't having any symptoms, and now it was sensitive for three days afterwards. But uh, gee whiz, that's not uh, that's not my problem, 
right? I mean, I don't need to own that. And I think too often we allow the patients, they always, it's your crown failed. Uh, you know, I'm having a problem with this work that you did. Uh, gee, you did this uh, for me, and now it's got decay in it, and uh, it's your fault. It's, you know, they always want to imply that, you know, put that monkey back on our back. And it's, I think too often we as a profession take it, right? I mean, I think we're right. too willing to accept the fact, oh, we don't want them to be upset. I mean, we care about people. We love our patients. Uh, we want to be liked by them. We want to continue that relationship. We don't want to offend them or upset them. But at the same point in time, I think they take advantage of, you know, who we are as practitioners by wanting to continually put that monkey on our back. And one of the things that you said to me that I thought was really powerful, Yolanda, you know, was on your best day, your best work isn't going to hold up to what the patient may do when they get home. And if right. you've got somebody that's drinking a, a case, I mean, here is, for crying out loud, here is a Mountain Dew dispenser on the person's desk at work, right? I mean, mm -hmm. I don't want my best work sitting there next to that thing all day long, right? Correct. And, and, and I mean, what can, how can anybody's work hold up to that? And so, I, and I, the bigger thing is, is if we're coming from a why, from the very beginning when we start to address this, and we show them the curiosity, and we show them the caring, and we show them the understanding that we all have, uh, then, then they can understand this as well. But we have to first get them to get to the ownership level first. And that's what wellness coaching, I think, is, is best about doing this with Canberra, is that they get to really work with our patients hand in hand. Right. I think, you know, and I think one of the things, too, Yolanda, that you brought up was just going through that risk assessment form and identifying what all of the risk factors are and the behaviors, it begins to put the ownership onto the patient, right? Yes. It's like mm -hmm. this is this is why your teeth look like this. This isn't because, or you know, if something fails, it's not because I did something wrong. It's maybe because you had these risk factors and you still have some things that you know you need to correct in your behavior or your diet or whatever. But it's like it helps them identify that um, cavities aren't a mystery. Uh, you know, they don't happen, it, cavities don't occur because I did a bad job. Um, cavities occur because of um, a set of risk factors that lead to the condition that caused that. And they're in, once we educate them, they're in control of their health. You know, we're their, par I like your word, we're their partner, we're their teammate on that in terms of helping them get healthy and be healthy. But, um, but the responsibility is on them. The monkey's not on my back. Absolutely. And I think that, yeah, and I think that's really a, a, a really important point that you brought up. It reminded me when I first trained with John Coyce, I mean, the first thing that you learn from John is um, I am not the Coast Guard. You know, the Coast Guard has to go out every day. It doesn't matter what the conditions are. If somebody's life is in danger, they have to go out and get them. Well, I'm not the Coast Guard. I don't have to go out today. So I don't have to do Coast Guard dentistry. I don't have to try and save every tooth. It's like I don't have to own that, like, um, and, and then do this Coast Guard dentistry where I'm trying to do this, you know, heroic uh, saving of teeth that are going to come back and fail, and then I'm going to have to own that. So it's like this whole concept of um, ownership, I think, is really important. I saw this case um, just last week, and I have to tell you, this case made my stomach hurt. It looks like the case that I, that I shared with you of the six anterior crowns. Um, I, I don't have the full history on this. This was published in a journal. Um, but I look at this and I think, wow, you know, this person is high risk for dental caries. And the way that this doctor treated them primarily was with a drill and porcelain. And I, I look at that and I think they did periodontal surgery. They did three implants on the lower. I can't determine they did any implants on the upper. Like I say, I don't have a full history here. But it's like that doctor is doing some Coast Guard dentistry here. It's beautiful work. Don't get me wrong. And that's how this, this dentist was trained. That's how we were all trained to, to deal with this disease. But my fear is I look at that patient, and with my experience in treating extreme dental caries risk patients, um, those things break down. And telling the patient to brush or floss is not a caries management plan in my mind. So being able to identify specifically why this patient's mouth looks like that um, and then maybe validating that the patient has altered that or corrected that before I go in and put $40,000 worth of porcelain on their teeth because I tell you what, here's where this comes back to haunt you, is this patient is going to expect you to own this. Like a year from now, this patient spent forty grand. It was life-changing. It's a beautiful smile. I, I'm all on board with all of that. The challenge is 
how, how predictable is this? How well is it going to hold up for this person? Did we identify exactly um, what was causing that disease? Do we know that the patient, in fact, did correct that? Were we able to help them? Are, are we confident going forward about owning $40,000 worth of porcelain in this person's mouth because in the, on your best work on your, in, on your best day can't hold up to uh, some of the abuse that, that patients can do to these. And, you know, you, you have to look at, um, you know, the biomechanics of teeth and are they, are they even structurally sound enough to do that? Um, and, uh, you know, are there compromises? Were compromises made here biomechanically? Was the patient aware of that? And did they accept that? Um, I just think that it's really important for us to be clear about if there's a problem here, like for like a patient that's extreme risk, that before we start doing a lot of porcelain work, um, you know, trying to treat this disease with a drill, I think we really need to treat it from a personalized medicine standpoint first and make sure we got a healthy biofilm growing for them. So the question I've got tonight is, you know, do you want to continue to own your patient's problems? Because I think that's one thing that Canberra, that you pointed out, Yolanda, I think that that's one of the, um, the things that Canberra helps us do is, is put the ownership of the disease back on the patient's shoulders where it belongs. Absolutely. Yeah, we can't we can't stomach and, and hold that on our shoulders and and still be able to continue really taking care of our patients that well uh, if we're owning things that we can't have any control over. Yeah, and I and nothing takes the joy out of my day more <laughs> than yes. a patient coming in that has decay under uh, you know and under a large bridge that uh, you know has a, that costs them a lot of money that you know they want me to own. I mean that that takes the joy out of what we do in a hurry, um, you know. And so you know, there's an alternative. You know, we can change what we do as as dentists and think more as physicians of the mouth um, and incorporate that into helping people. This patient uh, I've shown on some of my webinars. I saw this patient earlier this year. She's 15 years old. She does a reasonable job with her home care. She's in the middle of orthodontic treatment, but she's 15 years old. She now has 18 full crowns, two root canals, and she needs three additional crowns at this point in time. I'm the fourth dentist to see this patient, and as I'm interviewing the patient and the mother, I ask, you know, what's causing this? You know, do you know what's going on here? Why, why do you have all these crowns? They had no clue. No dentist had ever stopped to ask them about their diet, about their home care, about do you have a dry mouth, what Medicaid. Nobody had ever stopped to ask them what's going on. They just continued to diagnose the need for and provided more crowns. Really, at age 15, that something is not normal, you know, for a 15-year-old to have 18 permanent crowns, and she's actually going to have 21. Um, but nobody had stopped to, to pull the camera form out and say, let's figure out what's causing this. Um, you know, so when you do, uh, that makes a huge impact on the patient. And, I mean, in terms of developing a trust relationship, I think this is something that I, I think we can't emphasize enough is, you know, why we do what we do. So moving on, you know, I really want to thank you for sharing those thoughts. I, I think the whole concept of ownership was something I really wasn't even thinking about in terms of Canberra. But I really believe that it helps us help the patient own their own disease rather than trying to put that onto our shoulders. So uh, I, I, thought, uh, I thought that was brilliant. I really want to want to thank you for sharing that with us tonight. I'll probably you. Uh, also ask you. Go, go ahead. Oh, I was going to say also, I think that um, looking forward with this assessment, which is what I came into looking back on 10 years of Canberra, and the real question is why I approached you is, why hasn't this taken a bigger, bigger hold in dentistry is that this is looking into the future. We, I think that something like the case that you just showed, that should be a standard of care and someone should be held liable under that standard of care in the future. So I think that we, we all need to be taking that kind of level of thinking of being with our patients and seeing that as the appropriate standard of care that we all have. Yeah, I'd, I'd absolutely agree with you, Yolanda. And so we, and and I would tell you that we are making that change, uh, although gradually. I mean, we are slowly, I think, changing the the thought process on what is the standard of practice, uh, what is appropriate, and you know what's best care, um, and what are our best outcomes. So I think that you know all of us doing this um, are slowly making a change. We're making change in the dental school. That's had a huge impact. Uh, we're starting to see changes on state board requirements. Uh, the ADA is, you know, 
uh, changing, and I think too that uh, we're going to have um, risk carries risk assessment fee codes for the first time on our CDT here. So I think you know that's a result of all of us collectively working at this, you know, trying to just to move the profession forward. So um, no, nobody, <laughs> nobody single-handedly is doing this. It's really taken an effort by everybody that's been involved. Um, so when we get into the protocol here tonight, uh, basically Canberra is consists of assessment, testing, uh, if you're going to use a biometric, uh, a diagnosis, uh, then figuring out the treatment, the personalized medicine for that patient, delivering that treatment to the patient, and then reassessing or reevaluating uh, your care as you go through that process. So this is kind of the big picture of where we're headed. Tonight we're just going to focus on assessment and really just get down to, to one, one question that you need to answer to start this process. Um, things that you're going to need, you're going to need a 30-second elevator conversation. You can't go into the hygiene operatory and start spending 20 minutes talking about uh, dental caries and naming bacteria, and, which is exactly what I did. Please don't do that. That was a mistake. I, you, know, um, you need to just have a short story uh, for the patient. You need to explain to them why you're doing something or proposing something differently than you've done in the past. If they're a new patient, it's even easier because they don't know what to expect from you. And so you can just tell them, you know, in our practice, here's, here's how we do this and here's why. And it needs to be an analogy. I use the nail on the tire. I know that most of you have seen that. Bob Barkley used the houses on fire. Uh, but any analogy that makes sense to you, um, write that down. That's one thing you need to write down. And I would encourage you to practice it so that the next time that um, you have the opportunity to talk to a patient in that manner, that it's, it, it flows freely because it's something that you've said before. Uh, so my 30-second elevator conversation is about how getting a cat in your tooth is a lot like getting a nail in a tire. Uh, and every time you come in, we would you know, fix, take the nail and fix, take it out and fix your tire. Uh, the problem isn't that you've got a nail in your tire. The real problem is you've got nails in your driveway. And what I want to do now is let's figure out how many nails you have in your driveway, why they're there, help you get rid of the nails, and then you'll stop getting um, nails in your tire. And you know that's just a, hopefully that took me less than 30 seconds, and the patients go, oh, okay, did they get that. It doesn't have to be scientific. Um, you're going to need a caries risk assessment form. I'm going to show you four different forms tonight, uh, and I want you to you know contemplate which one you think you would like to use in your practice. If you want to use a biometric, uh, we're going to talk about that next time. We're going to get into biometrics and look at the different options, the cost, uh, the predictability, the research behind them. Uh, we're going to look at diagnosis then, and we'll talk about you know your therapeutic strategies, how you plan on implementing those in your practice, and then we're going to talk about fees, uh, or at least fee codes, and kind of give you a range or an expectation there. Um, so Canberra, you know, I want to make this simple. It's, it's you know, it's an easy thing. I just gave you my analogy with the. Um, the nails on the tire, i got to tell you, it works. I have another friend that likes to use weeds in the lawn, and they spray the weeds, and they fertilize the grass, and you know, give them that concept on uh, how you're going to change the biofilm and get things healthy. There are a lot of, I mean, there's a lot of different analogies. I'm sure you can come up with one of your own. Uh, certainly, this nail on the tire works really well, and people tend, tend to get that. And I'm in Blue Collar, Albany, Oregon, so that tends to work really well. Um, and then you just prescribe treatment. So let's talk about the forms tonight. There are four uh, forms in my mind that probably have the best uh, validity for you to use in your practice. The first is the ADA form. And here's a copy of that form. You can actually look this up on the ADA website. If you just Google search, I should have had that um, HTML in here. But if you just look this up, uh, Google search ADA, or American Dental Association, carries risk assessment form, and it'll lead you to this form. You can purchase these from the ADA, you can download them, you can print them, you can use it however you want. Uh, the, uh, the thing about this form is that they've got low risk, moderate risk, and high risk, and they give you a zero point for low risk, they give you a, a one point for moderate risk, and they give you ten points for each high risk answer that's yes. Uh, and then at the end of this, they, they add up your total score. Now that hasn't been validated in a clinic. There isn't a form where you add up and tally points and do that. I mean, it's an interesting idea. Um, hasn't been validated, to my knowledge, in any clinical trial uh, in terms of weighting at 10 points versus 1 point versus 0 points. Uh, the thing about this form, uh, if we look at the first item, it's fluoride exposure, 
Uh, you know, you find out whether or not the patient's been exposed to fluoride in sugary foods or drinks, um, including juice or carbonated, non-carbonated carbonated, uh, soft drinks. Um, Carrie's experience with the mother, we do know that that's an important um, predictive factor, particularly on smaller children. This form is actually for age six and over. We kind of break Carrie's risk assessment forms into zero to five and six and older. So this is really our adult form. Um, so that kind of that question for most of my adults, uh, you know, doesn't really fit. Uh, whether or not you have a dental home, again, that tends to be more. The science behind that is more around, you know, the zero to five year old children. Uh, the next general health conditions, um, you know, special health care needs, uh, chemo radiation, eating disorders, uh, medications. That certainly medications is going to be probably be the biggest. Um, or the most significant of those questions, and then certain drug and alcohol abuse. Um, then clinical conditions, cavitated or non-cavitated lesions or restorations. Uh, we certainly know that that, that uh, is very predictive going forward. Uh, most of the insurance companies now are uh, defining their own diagnosis, and we'll get into that at that point, on how many cavities you had in the last period of what time. And so here, moderate risk, you see, is one or two new cavities or restorations in the last three years, and a high-risk person would be having three or more uh, restorations in the last three years. And I would also share with you in my own, um, the private research that we did with, it was a multi-site with five practices, and we have, uh, I want to say, almost 8,000 uh, patients now in that study we have the data from. The number one uh, thing was, uh, in terms of disease indicators was the history, immediate history of decay. Um, so then we're looking at, and then down the line, teeth missing due to caries in the past 36 months, visible plaque, um, unusual tooth morphology, interproximal restorations, exposed tooth surfaces, restorations with overhangs, open margins, uh, orthodontic appliances, and severe dry mouth. Um, and I would tell you that some of those things have been validated, those questions have been validated in clinical trials. Some of them have not. I, don't, I haven't seen any validation on uh, how that should be weighted. So um, if this is one of the forms that you can use. Uh, certainly when you go to file your carries risk assessment fee code for patients uh, starting after January 1st when you do this, certainly the ADA form is going to be one that I, I would think would be recognized as a valid uh, assessment tool. Uh, by the insurance companies. Uh, I'm not sure that I agree with the uh, tally, trying to tally a score, uh, give them some numerical, you know, outcome. I'm not sure that that's as important. The other thing that I would that I would share with you when we get into the diagnosis is that when you go in the ADA definition here, and you look at their definition of low risk, uh, it has they have zero risk factors, they have zero disease indicators. And so they're, I mean, absolutely clean. I mean, they have not a single risk factor. And in the study that we did with the, you know, 8,000 patients, only 3% of the patients qualify for that based on our survey. So, um, again, that's not something that's been validated in a clinical trial, um, but that's the definition pretty much that we're all working around right at the moment. But I, I just think that that's probably, um, a little aggressive on that standpoint. Uh, I think a person could maybe have one risk factor and still be low risk for the disease. Um, you know, just they have a risk factor it doesn't necessarily put them um, at at moderate or high risk. The next form that I would share with you is the CDA carries risk assessment form. This is straight from John Featherstone's work. Um, John is a dean now at the University of California, San Francisco. He teaches a camera course. And I believe, Yolanda, you've been through his program. So. Um, Sorry, I was on mute. Yes, I, yes, oh, I have. Yeah. I mean, I thought you and I had had that conversation. I thought you'd been through that. My entire team here at, at Carry Free have been through his program as well. John was absolutely, and Doug Young were my uh, two first mentors, and I still spend a great deal of time. Um, trying to learn as much as I can from them. This was uh, John's work, and uh, Sophie Damagine did a graduate study, a uh, graduate student study with John uh, when she was at the school there a few years ago. They did a six-year retrospective study, and so this really is a representation of 
um, the basis of that, and and I and I use John's data, because so we've got questions that have been validated in a huge clinical trial, um, and so I feel very comfortable using those questions. Now, on John's form, the thing that um, you would identify first is that the disease indicators um, are first, and those are actually um, situations that we used to, or um, I would say, things that we used to consider to be risk factors, but the odds ratio on these four risk factors was so high in the clinical trial that they're actually, in fact, not risk factors, but they're actually indications of the disease. So um, if you have any one of those, you have this disease, um, visible cavitations or radiograph penetration to the dentin, um, radiographic approximal enamel lesions, radio, radiographic radiolucencies, um, that's particularly on posterior teeth, uh, white spots on active or progressing white spot lesions on smooth surfaces, and then have you had any restorations in the previous three years. So you're going to see some consistency on some of these questions or overlap between these different forms. Um, you know, circle all yes on, on one of those, and they've got this disease. As you go down to the very bottom of the column on the right, you see that little balance beam, and that's really the concept that John introduced of the caries balance, or let's say the caries imbalance. Uh, where if you have, you know, yes, there, they're putting big arrows on that side, and this person is tilted toward disease rather than health. And on the right side of that you know, fulcrum is, you know, the protective factors. Um, and that, you know, tips the scale back in favor of the um, of, of health. And so it kind of gives you kind of a, I guess, a visual on kind of the balance between being unhealthy or trying to be healthy, which may some people may find, you know, very helpful. The risk factors are the risk factor questions that I that I use. <clears throat> We're looking at um, high bacterial load, uh, visible plaque on the teeth, um, frequent snacking, deep pits and fissures, and um, salivary reducing factors like medications um, and inadequate salivary flow. So we actually see saliva represented twice on this form, and I think that that's appropriate. That's our, our biggest protective factor. And you know, having that uh, being reduced, if you have hyposalivation, that's a that's a, a real serious risk factor for us. Um, and the one thing on John Formy also goes into protective factors, like do they live in a fluoridated community? Uh, do they use fluoride toothpaste once a day? Um, you know, do they have other topical fluoride treatments? Uh, do they have uh, do they use xylitol gum, etc.? And do they have adequate saliva flow? And you know, so again, so you've got disease indicators, risk factors, and then also protective factors on this form. And kind of a visual, kind of a balance at the bottom that you can share with the patient. You know, this is the study that was published in uh, 2011, the 12,954 patients, a six-year retrospective study, and basically, you know, they looked at and determined which of these, what were the odds ratios for each of these risk factors, and then, you know, how did that uh, profile out in the population of the dental school patients that they studied, 15 and a half were classified as low risk, 22 percent as moderate risk, and 63 percent basically as high or extreme risk. I would tell you in the study that we did on private uh, care patients, um, only 3 percent were classified as low risk based on the ADA definition, um, which is probably a little more strict than what John was using in this, in this particular study. We found about then you know, 25% were moderate risk, and then about 66% were high or extreme risk. So the profile of our patients in private practice weren't too substantially different from, you know, what you know, they found in this study as well. Uh, then you've got the American Academy of Pediatric Dentistry form, and this form is actually for, again, it's the age bracket of six and older. They have a form for zero to five. In fact, by the way, uh, both the ADA and the CDA uh, and the AAPD and the CARI reform also have separate forms for that zero to five age bracket that I thought we'd really kind of direct this tonight more toward, you know, the, the six-year-olds to adults. Um, and so this form really, in my mind, is, is again, a little better directed at, at younger children, but even though it's for six-year-olds and above, but you got to understand pediatric dentists aren't really treating adults. They're treating maybe teenagers at the oldest. But, you know, patient is low socioeconomic status. Um, patient has more than three between meals, sugar-containing snacks or beverages during the day. Again, you're going to you get a sense for some of the consistency of these questions, and then it really comes down to how the form is laid out. 
patient has special health care? Are they special needs? Um, are they a recent immigrant? Now, those things have actually, there's a lot of data uh, to support that, particularly in children, that those things are certainly high or moderate risk. Um, protective factors, again, are, you know, they have optimal fluoride exposure in, in the drinking water. Are they brushing daily? Are they assuming uh, topical fluoride treatments? So they have a dental, regular dental home. Um, and then the clinical findings are, you know, they have one or more interproximal lesions. Uh, do they have active white spot lesions? Do they have, in this form, um, low salivary flow uh, as a as a high risk factor um, that would make the patient high risk? And you know, do they have defective restorations? Are they wearing an oral appliance? So again, I think you start to see some overlap on a lot of these questions. Um, you know, this is a, a pretty short, simple form. I think there are a number of questions there. Uh, the recent immigrant, low socioeconomic status, I'm not really um, probably going to be inclined to ask my patients or identify them, maybe profile them that way, but uh, for children in some practices that would be, you know, appropriate. Um, and then at the end, at, you know, at the bottom, you're just citing those conditions, you know, you make an, a, a decision on are they high, moderate, or low risk. I am, and they compared this to, uh, in a study just this, that was published last year in the American Dental Association Journal, and found that the salivary culture of mutant streptococci alone in this population of low-income Hispanic children was more predictive uh, than the carries risk assessment test and variations of the AAPD carries assessment test for accuracy, that sensitivity and specificity, and predictive values. So. Um, you know, that's a cha I mean, that's a challenge for us on using any of these forms, but um, certainly this brings into question in my mind, you know, whether or not you'd want to use that form in your, in your private practice for adults. But just using a, a, an MS culture was more predictive and had a higher sensitivity and specificity. Um, and then we've got the carry-free form, which has been, um, this is probably the eighth generation of forms that I have used in my own practice, and I've continued to modify it. Uh, this form we've been using in this uh, current form for about uh, three years now. And I would tell you the, the thing that you would notice differently on this form is the first three questions are all behavioral questions. Wanting to know would they like to have uh, free screening today. If diagnosed uh, at risk for cavities, you know, would you be interested in discussing treatment options specifically for that? And if needed, would you be willing to modify your dietary habits? Now, the other thing, and we'll get into this in the, in the next webinar, but the question is, who fills out the form, where do they fill out the form, and who evaluates and, and goes over it with them? And you've got options in each of those three questions, so those will be coming up. Um, one of the things that I found was that it takes a lot of time in a hygiene operatory that we don't have. That's a real capacity issue for us to sit and fill out one of these forms interview style. So that was problematic. So what I do is have the patient self-report their risks, and they also answer those three psychological questions, which give me a, a really quick read on where this person is at. Doesn't mean that they answer no to question number one, that I'm not going to bring it up. Uh, it, it opens the door for me to ask a different question and have a coaching conversation with them. So um, you know, if the patient says yes, I know, they say yes, 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 I know this is a person that's concerned about their health, they want to know more about this disease, and they're willing to make some behavioral changes if, ne if necessary. Um, the person that says no gives me the opportunity to say, gee, I, you know, kind of find that interesting that you answered no to that. Uh, this is a free screening for this disease, and I noticed that you also have several cavities. Um, you know, tell me more about that. And without being judgmental, just say, you know, tell me, tell me more, that's interesting, tell me more about that. Um, and you're going to find out maybe what their objection or their concern or um, maybe what they don't understand. Uh, and it opens the door for you to have that conversation. But So I have the patient fill out everything above the gray line. The next part is the risk factors. And you'll notice these are the risk factors straight off of the CDA form. And again, we have the patient identify. They either have these risks or they don't. And I have the patient report the risk. And I have to tell you the two things that we've done uh, in my own experience in my practice that have been the most successful at this, uh, having the patient fill out the form so we alleviate the capacity problem in the hygiene appointment, and then having the patient self-report their risk factors to us is, is huge. Um, me trying to convince the patient that they have dry mouth, that they don't, they're not aware of or don't think they have, um, 
is a whole lot different than having the patient tell me that they, you know what, I noticed my mouth is dry during the day, and it is, it, it does bother me. Now that you mention it, uh, I've identified that, and now I kind of expect you to talk to me about it and tell me how we can help help fix that. So having them self-report the risk factors is huge, and I think most of those risk factors are things that they are capable of self-reporting. The disease indicators on this, then, those are things that observations that the hygienist and the dentist need to make. Um, and those are straight out of the Featherstone form, the same thing, new progressing visible cavities, new progressing approximal radiographic radiolithencies, uh, new and active white spot lesions or a decay history that's a concern. Um, so, you know, I give you a little flexibility on that in terms of is the decay history a concern or not. Um, and then we identify whether or not they have disease indicators. If they have disease indicators, they have the disease. They're automatically high risk for this disease. Um, and then the next is the biometric, if you're going to use one, and we'll go through the bio, different biometrics that are available, and we'll talk about how that uh, fits into the diagnosis. A lot of people don't understand how we use the biometric um, or use any biometric, for that matter, in terms of where does that fit in our assessment for our diagnosis. So we're going to talk about that in the, in the, probably in the next webinar. Um, and then you come down to a summary. And I like to look at, are the risk factors a concern? Are the disease indicators a concern? Are, you know, is the biofilm challenge, is that biometric a concern to me? So rather than just a simple yes, no, and let that up a score and your answer was 65, I want to be able to apply a little um, strategic thinking to this and look at this patient and make an evaluation based on your experience and knowledge. Um, and that's what we're being paid to do. So. Um, and then you, that fits just into a grid, and then we, we stratify people in, from low risk to extreme risk um, at the bottom of the page, and based on whether they have risk factors or disease indicators. So uh, that's the carry-free form. I would share with you this. This study was published, um, and I've got a paper that was just accepted for publication in the Journal of uh, Prosthetic Dentistry. And I go through a paragraph on sensitivity and specificity of, of the different risk assessment forms and the fact that we don't have a lot of scientific validation. I mean, we've got the Featherstone study. Uh, you've got a few other studies that have been done. But at the end of the day, I mean, we're developing a new field here. While it's logical and it makes sense and it works, uh, we don't have, um, you know, 30 um, 10-year retrospective clinical trials, we can go back and do a meta-analysis on and, and start to do that. And I think going forward, we as a profession need to become less addicted to our, our meta-analysis of, um, you know, of random controlled trials because those studies cost so much money to perform, uh, and there's so the the there's going to be a huge limitation of, of research and healthcare dollars. That going forward. We're going to need to learn how to manage and make decisions based on, on less science than we've had maybe in the past. Now, I, that's not an excuse for not having science, but I think in, in the real world, that's really the future that, that we're looking at. Um, so it's like we don't really have a lot of science. We have some, but we don't have a lot. So if you want to know exactly what the sensitivity and specificity is for each question on the form, on any four of these forms, um, you know, we have odds ratios, and we have one one you know large clinical trial. Um, I have my own private you know clinical trial that we conducted at Carry Free with you know five multi-site, but um, but there are limitations, and I think that we need to be honest with where we're at on this. Doesn't mean I'm not doing this. I'm going to continue to do this, but we maybe don't have the uh, the abundance of scientific information that some people would feel more comfortable with. So you've got. Risk assessment forms, you've got the ADA, you've got the CDA, you've got the APD, and you've got the carry-free form. Uh, this is the, the question, this is decision number one. I'm excited to be here. I pick one. And so I just, on your handout that you should have, it should say, uh, you know, should have that question, and there should be those four options, and I want you to pick the one that, that you want to use in your practice. So that's the first decision um, that you need to make to, to move forward with this. Um, and we're going to go, like I say, we're going to go through about 20 more decision points in the next two webinars so that you should have a complete roadmap for yourself. Um, you know, what, how does it work in my practice? You know, Canberra, it's really a function of I'm doing the, the risk assessment to get to the diagnosis to answer the why question so I can target my therapies in a personalized medicine fashion for the patient. 
I can monitor my outcome over time, and then I can have some confidence, the patient and I both can have some confidence and predictability of their outcome. And I showed you some cases tonight that, that I, you know, would concern me as a practitioner to, to treat until I, I treated patients like that, but it was after two years of uh, these patients had demonstrated to me that, that I know they're healthy and that we understand, and they understand what was causing their disease. They've made those corrections and they've been healthy for a period of two years. I have a much greater comfort and joy around um, my confidence that they're not going to come back to me and try and put the ownership of their disease back on my shoulders. So um, by doing that, I would tell you that um, one of the things that I thought tonight driving over here to do this webinar is, We've got this debacle called Obamacare right at the moment, and the reality is it's not going away. Uh, at some point in time, the website will work. People will be able to sign up, but the cost of health care, medical care, health insurance is going up. And what's going to happen to a lot of employees is employers are going to start to cut other benefits to be able to continue to fund their primary health insurance. So I would predict in the next ten years you're going to see a lot of patients who currently have dental insurance will no longer have dental insurance. So in our practices, our patients are going to get a lot more selective or discriminating about how they spend their health care dollars on dentistry and just coming in and having single tooth crowns done every time they get a cavity. I think the whole concept of wellness um, is and being able to help that patient get healthy this whole model of wellness is going to be like a huge wave, and those practices that do this are going to be successful with their patients because they will invest money. Uh, they look at it as an investment when they know that it's going to hold up and last down the road. Um, and that's one of the things that Canberra helps us do as well. So that's one of the things I think going forward that this is something that uh, we all should be doing for a lot of different reasons, but that's, that's one more why I would I would tell you, in my practice, I use this carry-free form, and I use this biometric. We're going to talk about that next time. If you haven't read the book, Balance, uh, <clears throat> if you would tonight either send a message or call carry-free, uh, we'd be happy to send you a free copy of this book. It's all about risk assessment. It's all about Canberra, but it doesn't tell you how to implement it specifically. And so that's really the basis of this webinar series. And we're actually, uh, Bob and I are writing a, a second, working on a second book that was, that's really going to be fundamentally just about how do you answer these questions and how do you implement it. So I want to thank you tonight. Uh, Yolanda, thank you so much for being here and sharing your valuable insight on ownership of disease. I think that that's a, a, a huge, should be a huge why for all of us in terms of the benefit of Canberra. Um, and I'm going to leave these two words with you. Um, my friend uh, Miguel Ortiz. Uh, Mickey from uh, Ensenada told me a, a while back, he said, Kim, my friend, there are two words that will open many doors for you, push and pull. So thank you all. I think that we have time. Um, Janelle, I think we've got time for a couple of questions. Our next okay, webinar great. is in, yeah. in, in three weeks. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Cooch and, and Dr. Mangram. We have some really great questions coming in. Um, I think uh, like you said, Doctor, we have some time for a few of them. Uh, let's start with um, what advice do you have for an office that is struggling to get all team members on the same page? How do you motivate your team to adopt this new philosophy? You know, I have to tell you, that is, that is probably the biggest challenge um, that you're going to face is trying to get everybody on your team on board. And so I think that it's really important that the dentist is the leader and the visionary on this. Um, so I, I've, got, I've got two pieces of advice here. The number one is to be very clear about your why. If you write it down, this is why I want to do this. This is the benefit that I see for, my, for our patients, and this is the benefit that I see for our practice collectively as a group going forward. And it, the clearer that you can be on those statements, the better. And then I would have a, a, a team meeting, and I would sit down, and I would be very clear, this is something that's very important to me. This is why I want to do this. This is why I believe in it. This is what I think the benefit's going to be for our patients. Number one, this is who we're doing this for. This is why we come to work every day. And then number two, this is the benefit you know, for us as a group, as a team, to be able to help more people. 
And so I, I think number one, it's it's really important for you to be clear. That's why I started with that why tonight. That's why you know, I asked Ilana to be here to talk about even different aspects that I hadn't considered about real benefits of doing this. The second it comes back to a book um, called Tribal Leadership. And the one thing that we know, and this is another great business book, by the way, um, David Logan wrote this book. I think David is at Stanford, but it's a great book. And the, the point in tribal leadership is that we form tribes. Human beings form tribes. We always have. We always do. It doesn't matter what organization or where we're in or what population, we form tribes and we belong to groups. And the most effective, minimal tribe is three people. And so what you need, if you've got a, a team of six people or a team of ten people, and actually this is something that I'm going to, this is one of those decisions. In fact, I think it's, I think it's number 20 or 21 is as we go through these in the next two webinars is identify the two powerful people that you can form a triad with in on your team because if there's three of you that believe in this and are pushing it it'll happen the rest of the team will join your tribe and if you're out there by yourself until you get at least two more people that are pushing this ball with you you've got to going to have a really long struggle so i mean that's what our human behavioral studies and that's what this book on tribal leadership would tell you. So identify, like right now, sit down and identify which two people on this team are the most critical for you to have on your tribe, your triad, that you can meet with regularly to make sure that you, that you get to integrate and, and accomplish this in your practice. And I would take them out to lunch and maybe you need to meet with them on a weekly basis and let's talk about how do we do this. But again, the whole question for that team, for your triad, comes back to understanding your why. This, this whole thing comes back to your philosophy, your core philosophy on why you're doing this. And, I, and your team is with you uh, for the same reason your patients are. And if they're really clear and they understand your why and you're able to articulate that, I would be surprised if all of your teammates don't get on board. And if they don't, then they're probably on the wrong team. You know, if they're why people come to you, not because of what you do, but why you do it. If they're not there because of your why, they're, they're, they shouldn't be on your team. Great question, by the way, Janelle. Great, great. Thank you. Uh, the next question, uh, should I be doing this assessment on every patient at every appointment? No. <laughs> Instead of my normal long-winded answer, the answer there is no. Um, I think that the answer is yes for some patients, but what I would encourage you to look at is um, and instead of trying to dive into the deep end of the pool, maybe tippy-toe into the shallow end and do this on, agree as a team to do this on every new patient for three months, and then agree to do it on, in my practice, what we do is we do it on every patient once a year. Now, on the patients that are in active, personalized therapy, um, I don't necessarily have them fill out the form or review it, but I, re you know, I review the, the two or three issues that I know that we're working on every time I see them. So that's part of that coaching language um, in terms of that conversation. If it's a dietary issue and we're working on a behavior around their diet, every time they come in, yep, you can bet I'm going to check in with them. I want to know how they're progressing, if they're having challenges, how can I help support them, what else do we need to do, how would they what would they think is the next best step for them to help continue on a, on a process of being successful there. Um, but I would say there are some practices that have been successful doing it on literally everybody, um, I, and you're going to want to do that. Um, but I wouldn't be opposed to somebody saying, hey, I'm just going to start by doing this on my new patients, and then as we get comfortable with it and my team are we're more confident with it and starting on a, you know, well, the form that we use, you know, you have the patient fill out either in the waiting room or you can even mail it to them ahead of time and have them bring it in um, so that it's already filled out. And I just want to do a risk assessment and a biometric on them once a year. Um, and I think that's adequate for most, for most patients. But the patients that you're in active therapy with, I think you need to review at least uh, whatever it is that, that you've targeted to work on with the patient every time that you see them. And those patients, I would tell you, I'm seeing at least once a month. Okay, another great, great, great. Oh, uh, time for one more question. Um, we are having problems directing the conversation after the patient has said no to screening, but we know they need treatment. How do you direct the conversation after a no? 
And uh, you know, and that's a really another good question. Um, and Ferocious Knight, my personal wellness coach that I've been training with for a couple of years, says, uh, as a favorite saying, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make them drink. But you can feed them salty peanuts. So just because a patient said no, doesn't mean it's no for forever, or doesn't mean hell no. Um, so the first thing I like to do is, again, is ask that question. Gee, I find it interesting that uh, I notice that you've got like six cavities today, you've had three last year, you had three the year before that, um, and you weren't interested in, you know, going forward on, you know, having a risk assessment. You know, can you, you know, tell me more about that. Uh, you know, what's going on? Tell me about that, because I think a logical person would want to have that kind of information. So, particularly if you had this disease, so there's a, there's there's information there that's missing for you. And so I just want to ask them in a non-judgmental way, gee, tell me what's going on. I, I, you know, tell me more about that because, you know, I'm concerned and, and I think this might help you. And why is it that you've chosen, you know, tell me the reasons that you don't want to do it, right? And it may be that the answer is no for now. And I think we see that a lot of the patients, I can't do it right now, but I want to do it. Uh, let's talk about it in six months. You know, I'm okay with that. I mean, the patient's in charge. If this is the patient's, the monkey is on, squarely on the patient's back. Um, I continue to provide the information and education and opportunities. Continue to open doors and leave them open for the patient. Um, and maybe they're not going to say yes today, but that doesn't mean they won't say yes six months from now. Or it doesn't mean they won't say yes two years from now. Um, it may be something else going on in their life that, you know, it's just not appropriate today. Um, that they need to postpone it for one reason. You know, unless you ask, you don't know. You just assume they're not interested. It may be that their daughter is just getting married and their wife wants to go on a, um, a mission trip to Africa and they're scrambling to put the money together to do that. I heard that from a patient today when I asked that question. I'm like, oh, well, great. And the patient said, well, can we do this? Can we do this like and revisit it like in January? I'm like, yeah, absolutely. That, that, that makes perfect sense. Um, so it's really a matter of instead of just you know, closing the door when somebody says no, open the door back up, ask the question in a non-judgmental way, and then continue to give them, you know, maybe you're not interested now, but, you know, let me give you a copy of this book uh, that was written about tooth decay. And, and, you know, you might find something in there that's interesting. And if you do or you see something you want to talk about, you know, mark it up, underline it, dog ear the page, whatever, and bring it back and, you know, and point it out to me. Let's talk about it. So always try and give them an opportunity to, to have an open door to come back to discuss it. So literally, you can't force somebody to do something they don't want to do. And I, I think for us, we all want to see everybody be healthy. And so it's hard for us to, it's like, oh, yeah, I can help you so much if you would just let me. But um, people are going to do that on their own time. And so uh, sometimes we just have to be patient and let them, let them come to us. But again, just keep the door open. Uh, another, those are really great questions tonight. Great, and, and thank you, everyone, for all your great questions. Um, again, any questions that were not answered by Dr. Kush will be answered via email uh, within the next few days. Uh, we really appreciate your time. Thank you for participating in this webinar tonight. An email will be sent tomorrow uh, with a link to the recording for anyone that wants to share this webinar with their staff. And please feel free to contact us with any questions. Um, if you'd like to learn more about implementing Canberra into your practice, again, we do offer complimentary one-on-one -on -one webinars, and we'd be happy to schedule one that fits into your schedule. Excellent. And thank you, Janelle. I was just going to point out, I will be at the San Diego Dental Convention for anybody that's in the San Diego area, and I think Yolanda's going to be there with me. Uh, November 1st, I'm speaking Friday from 3 to 5, and I'm actually going to go through the entire uh, two-hour, three-hour program of, of implementation there. So. Uh, we've got a lot of work to do on our next webinar. I know that we've got 10 questions that we have to make decisions on. Uh, so uh, keep your pencil sharp, and everybody have a great week, and I will see you again in, in three weeks. Thank you all for being here tonight.